your Bibles with me to James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. That's James 19 to 27 of chapter 1. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to what the word to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. For if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is God's word. Good evening, it's uh, great to be here. I'm John, John McIndoe, uh, pastor at Pennant Hills Baptist. I've been here a long time ago, a few times, but COVID's impacted all that. Can I just say, as we start, how excited I was to hear your announcement about your Holiday Kids Club. I've heard about that Kids Club in past years and how great it has been and how outward-focused and missional it has been. And can I also say, as someone as part of another church, coming out of COVID is not easy, and organising big missional activities is not easy when people are still, in a sense, finding their feet. But can I encourage you as a fellowship to just reinforce that announcement and get behind it? It's exciting to hear that you're actually taking on something that big. And I know that in the past for this church, it has been big. Um, and I really want to encourage you to have that outward focus for that mission. It's exciting. Second thing I want to say before I start is um, a preacher should always preach to themselves first. That's been my kind of philosophy. And the message I'm sharing tonight was one that I gave at Penno two weeks ago. We're going through James, James's epistle. And it convicted me. And so when I thought, well, what am I going to speak on tonight? I figured, I thought about the week just passed and how badly I've let myself down in terms of this message. And so I thought I'd better, I think it's something that I would like to almost speak to myself again. Um, if you hear some of the stuff I'm saying, please don't think that I'm attacking you personally because I don't know most of you hardly at all. And please don't think that I'm saying anything about your church. I hope you hear me speaking the word of God. And I really am speaking to myself. And it's a message literally from two weeks ago. So let me pray. I like to do that. Father God, open, your, open our hearts by your spirit. That way we may hear your truth. And little by little, little by little every day, be prepared to submit and change to your good purposes. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, what is Christianity? Here's a dictionary definition I got off the web. It's a noun. It's the religion based upon the person and teachings of Jesus Christ or its beliefs and practices. That, that's okay. I thought it wasn't actually the best definition. I looked at Wikipedia. Wikipedia said, I think they got a better definition of Christianity. It's an Abrahamic monotheistic religion based upon the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, it's the world's largest religion, blah, 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 blah. On goes Wikipedia. What is Christianity? I know that's a pretty basic question for Christians. Is it those people who identify on the census that I am a Christian? Is that Christianity, that group, that, that subset of people? Or, or no, no, is it those who go to church? They're, that's Christianity. Or is Christianity a set of religious beliefs, doctrines? that have been built on the Jewish scriptures that claim Jesus as the Messiah, the saviour of the world. Is that Christianity? 
Maybe Christianity is our sectarian structures. So Christianity, well, that would include those who adhere. That's, let's say, maybe Baptists, Methodists, Orthodox. Uh, then there's not Christianity. Well, the Mormons, JWs, Islam, that's not Christianity. Or is, are we making it too complicated? Is, is Christianity the result of a basic confession? It's those who confess that Jesus is Lord, that most basic statement. Is Christianity those in a personal relationship with God, if I can phrase it another way, through Jesus Christ? I think it's all those things in some ways, and I think maybe we could say more. But I want to say another, suggest another way to approach this question, what is Christianity? And I think it's the approach that James takes in his letter. Christianity is essentially a life to be lived. It's a life to be lived. In fact, in other words, it goes beyond a message that has to be heard and accepted. It goes beyond symbols like baptism. It goes beyond adherence to a certain grouping. It even goes beyond a confession or, or a sense of having a relationship with God. Christianity is a life to be lived. Christianity is, in a sense, more verbal than it is a noun, substantive. It's done. Even our symbols, take baptism, for instance, that great symbol of becoming a Christian, the whole symbolism of baptism presupposes that you come out of the water to live a life as a Christian. If you take that basic Christian confession, Jesus is Lord, it presupposes a life to be lived. If he's Lord, he's Lord. You've started a new job. You've got the boss. This is your boss. Well, I don't have to listen to anything the boss says because I'm going to do my own thing. Well, no, no, no. If you've got to, your work will be shaped by what your boss says. If Jesus is Lord, your whole life must be shaped by the fact that he is Lord. It's a life to be lived. And I think most of us, most people, know this intuitively, intrinsically. One of the, I think it's one of the main reasons that people are very reluctant to become Christians. They'd have to change their life. It's one of the reasons I think people are often reluctant to get baptised because it's such a powerful symbol of a change of life. And if I can't match that, then I don't want to get baptised. And I think even for us who may be committed to these truths, it's something that we're all too quick to sideline or minimise or redefine or look for a substitute because living a life as a Christian is a big calling. James urges us consistently not to be fakers, but to live out our faith and be doers of the word. In chapter 1, he's already really laid a foundation of faith. He spoke to him about when troubles come upon us, whether they're external troubles or whether they're internal troubles from, from temptations from within, we are called, he says in, early in chapter 1, to lean into the goodness of God, to put our faith in God and in his son Jesus and seek in Jesus renewal and cleansing. The very last verse before our passage, verse 18. So. He, God, chose to give us birth. Here's a new birth through the word of truth. There is the gospel that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he's created. New people through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus. Now, to be clear when I say this, there is no Christianity without this word of truth without the gospel message. But the gospel message must be lived in a real life, in real behaviour. Uh, to give you an imperfect analogy, but I think a helpful one, it's a little bit like having a skeleton. A skeleton gives shape to a body. It, in one sense, a skeleton suggests hope because there's something to be built on that skeleton. But a skeleton by itself is dead and lifeless. 
It needs flesh. It needs life. And when we put our faith in Jesus, we receive new birth, life from God, the gift of his spirit. And this life is not a set of doctrines or propositions. It's life. And to be truly a life, it must be lived. Isn't that basic? If it's not being lived, it's not life. Christianity must be animated. It must have purpose. It's a life to be lived. So James, then having said this, goes on to identify one real touchstone, a real litmus test of the life being lived. As we work out our faith in practice, and it's really basic. The Christian life in so many ways is so simple. And we often think the simple things in life are easy because they're simple. Well, not for me, let me tell you. If I could burn James's admonition into my psyche, if I could have done it over 30 years ago when I got married, if I could shape my life every moment of every day by this one simple admonition, my life would be radically changed. We listen in love, or as James puts it, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We're to listen with love. Be excellent at listening. We start with the ear. First thing we do, we're attentive to others. Not to ourselves and our own self-voice. We're listening. That's such a basic skill. That's such a powerful skill in every area of life. To be a good listener. To be attentive first. Active. And then, because we're such a good listener, we are slow to speak. We move to our lips. James doesn't say don't speak. He says be slow to speak. Be measured with what you say. Don't just blurt things out. Don't rush in. Don't be the person who needs to have the final word and is always looking for where you can say and have your power and your control. Be slow to speak. And I think even that speaking reflects itself in other ways because sometimes even if we do keep our mouth shut... What's inside of us bursts out through our body language. Or passive aggressive acts to punish. Be slow to speak. Because James then says, moving to the hand, be slow to become angry. Now, anger is an important emotion. There are many things that we should get angry about, but not with quick rage. Be slow to clench that fist, because impulsive anger always reaps destruction. Because you know what? This is so simple. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Is that true in your life? I can tell you 100% it's true in my life. I grew up in a family that was very quick to express emotions. In other words, quick to get angry. In other words, temper was normative. We weren't one of those families that just passively aggressive, held it all in and then punished others in sneaky ways. We just punished Quick. And that's got some, that's not all bad in some ways, but I tell you what, what a pattern of destruction it leaves. And that's a struggle that I continue to fight to be slow with my anger. Slow to speak as someone who's highly verbal and can be particularly destructive with my lips because I can use them well when I want. 
so much damage done in my own life. If I could wind the clock back. So much hurt for my children. So much hurt for my family and friends. So much hurt for my wife. So much hurt for me. And this is true in churches. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. And slow to become angry. We don't listen. We jump to conclusions. We speak when we shouldn't. We then seek to punish. We want to hurt other people. And the anger flows and the wounds bleed. Got some parents here tonight. Mums and dads. What a difference it would make. Don't you tell me that. Get back. I'm done. It's a normative pattern for many of us. But what if you were in your family with, Mark, with your children? Quick to listen. Maybe they do have a perspective that needs to be heard. Maybe. Slow to speak and then slow to become angry. Spouses, those of you who are married, would never apply to your marriage, would it? Or you personally, it's always, mm, you're looking at your husband or your wife at the moment? No, look at yourself. That you'd be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. This is a touchstone of faith, of the word of truth at work in your life. This is the gospel in action, gospel-shaped living. So simple. So let's start doing it. Let's fix it all up. Control our tongue. Stop getting angry at the drop of a hat. Well, it's a lifelong battle. Where do you start? Well, you start where Christianity always starts. The way we begin the Christian life and the way we are to continue in the Christian life the first word of the gospel, repent. Repentance and faith. Well, actually, James doesn't use those words. He, here's how he puts it. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil which is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Put off, James says, like filthy clothing, Get rid of all that moral filth and evil that contaminates you. Get rid of that. That's repentance. Turn from evil and then put on the word that has been implanted in you. It picks up that idea of the word of truth in verse 18, the word of the gospel of Jesus. You want to start? Start with repentance. Start with saying, I'm going to put that anger and that loose language off. I'm going to put my faith in Jesus and his word. I'm going to remember that I'm a sinner. And you know what? And then you do that every day. Because that's how you live the Christian life. Repentance and faith. It's a life to be lived. Daily, put off the filth. Repent. Daily, receive the word. Obey in faith the word of gospel. Remind yourself of who Jesus is. Read the word. Every day. You know what the wonderful truth is though? Every day. Every day is the opportunity for a new start. Even today, even in your life, I do believe it. Every day is a new day for repentance and faith, for putting off the filthy and humbly accepting the word. In your context, in your situation, every day, even today. Now that may sound too simple, but this is Christianity lived. A constant putting off, a constant receiving and putting on the word of truth, the gospel, living with a desire to live the word. Sounds easy. In practice, difficult as we deal with our own hearts. So difficult that we keep looking for substitutes that have the appearance of the Christian life but are actually fake. 
And in doing, embracing these substitutes, we fool ourselves. Jane, James, I think, highlights two popular substitutes. I might call them Christianity light, Christianity easy, Christianity fake. And the first substitute is we become a hearer of the word and think that is sufficiently sufficient. I've heard the gospel. I know the truth. James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. It's not much complicated in James in many ways. Don't just listen. Do what it says. Come to church Sunday after Sunday. Faithful, faithful, faithful. Hear the word. Expose yourself to the good news of Jesus. Maybe if you go to the next level, you read a bit of theology or a lot of theology. Maybe you're really passionate about religious discussion and debate. And perhaps even then delighting in a sense, not too much. But you can't help but delighting in finding fault in others and their convictions. You've got a passion for the truth. But you live a life that is short on love and generosity and sacrifice that barely reflects grace, let alone kindness. This is foolish. To say that Jesus is Lord and listen to the word and fight for the word and not live out the deepest aspects of it in your character, please repent. Please go back to the word. Jesus said at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, trouble and turmoil. They blew against that house, trouble and turmoil, yet it did not fall because it's had its foundation on the rock of someone doing the word, the words that Jesus spoke. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, being a hearer only, is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and... Well, the rain came down and the troubles came and the stream rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Do not merely listen to the word, says James, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. He goes on to give an illustration. He's really serious about this. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is somewhat like someone who looks at his face in a mirror And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. What? Now, I know that you're not that different to me. You look in the mirror and you look intently at your face. You know bumps and crevices and things that most people just treat as you and they don't even take any notice of. You know where they all are. You also look at the mirror and say, have I brushed my hair? Does my makeup look balanced and healthy today and good if you're doing makeup? Is there something caught in my teeth? Is there a spot there? God's word is like a mirror that exposes our true nature, our heart. That's what it does. If you read it, if you expose yourself to it, how foolish. To look intently and yet not act on what is revealed. My hair's really messy this morning. God. I think I got something stuck in my teeth. What are you looking in the mirror for? Is it just vanity? I got something stuck in my teeth. Beautiful guy, you. (laughs) That's stupid. What are you going to Bible study for? What are you coming to church for? What are you reading your Bible or having devotions for if you're not willing to hear it and let it reflect upon your heart and then seek to obey it? 
This is foolish. Or is it just vanity? You're only looking at the word to make yourself feel good, look good and fool yourself. You're just a skeleton without flesh, without life. But whoever looks into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, who lets the gospel sink deep, not forgetting what they heard, but doing it, oh, they will be blessed. They will be blessed in what they do. You want to live a blessed life? How about this? You really want some blessing in your life? I can promise you blessing. Here's a prosperity message for you. You want blessing untold? Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Be slow to come, become angry. I can promise you for as many days as the Lord gives you on this earth, you will be blessed. That's not a, no, it is a name it and claim it. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Blessings in my life. Guaranteed. Flesh and bones, life to be lived. Second substitute is that you become a doer only. This is a substitute for repentance and faith. I'm only a doer, but you say, hold it. Didn't James just tell us that we've got to be doers of the word? Or be a doer? Yeah, that's true, but you just don't miss the second part of that statement. You've got to be a doer of the word, of the gospel, of the message, of God's word, obedient from the heart, such that real faith is put into practice. It is so much easier to, be, to, to embrace instead an outward form of faith without a change of heart changing our life. James says, To those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, back to where we started, well, they deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. That word religion, it reflects this idea of being careful in outward forms. For those who are religiously careful in their outward forms, now, there's nothing wrong with our outward forms of our religion or our faith. They can help to systematize truth. They can help us to repeat truth so that it gets deeply ingrained in our beings. They can give us a sense of order. But they are not the heart of faith. And if our religious forms are not leading us to more Christ-like behavior in our speech in the way we handle anger, in managing our lusts or our envy and our greed, then those religious forms are all worthless, useless noise. Lots of doing, and that's about it. Really, they be, then become attempts at salvation by works. I'll prove God that I really like him by doing all this outward stuff. And he'll really be really, really happy when my heart doesn't change. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? We're to call live by faith in Jesus, and faith works. It changes us and it calls for a response. Because Christianity is essentially a life to be lived. In other words, the proof of your faith is in the pudding, to use that phrase. We've got to put this into daily practice. Now, James has already mentioned the first practical aspect of this, which is keeping a tight control on our tongues, which is really, if you can control your tongue, I tell you, you, control, you can control just about anything. It's a measure of self-control. But he then goes on to mention two other critical outworkings of the gospel in practice. Religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, living out the word, 
to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The first thing I think James mentions there in general terms is charity. Another word for love. Because the gospel, we're to live out the word. We're to live out the gospel. The gospel message of Jesus is a message of God coming to us in our poverty and in our desperation and in our hopelessness, lost in our sin, unable to save ourselves and providing what we can't, we can't have so that we can live. Now where to live this truth? Where to be people for the poor and the marginalized, the widows and the orphans, the lonely, those who have a limited capacity to care for themselves? Where to be their champions? Now orphans, we don't really have that many orphans in our society anymore, do we? I'll tell you what we do have. We have a mountain of children managed by the state looking for foster care homes. I've got a friend who works in this area and she says to me, where are the Christians? They're advertising in the Mardi Gras. They're advertising all over the place, just finding somewhere where they can place children in desperate need whose parents cannot look after them. That's a big call. It takes a lot to look after a foster kid. My wife and I looked into it and at that stage in our life we said it's just too hard. I get it. But who's asking the question and the Christians to look after the orphans? The orphans and the widows. Well, here's where I see the elderly. Particularly the elderly in nursing homes. For two and a half years, they have been imprisoned. In a system under enormous stress. And they're lonely. And they want someone to come in and hear their heart. And sit down with them. And show them the love of Jesus. Firstly, through practical being quick to listen and slow to speak. This is charity. Caring for those who are disabled, who have great needs. Meeting those whose lives are messy and perhaps those whose psyches psyches are unstable, those with really difficult mental illness, and befriending them and loving them for who they are as they are. Oh, gee, it's hard to be a Christian. (laughs) Who's going to care? Who will be a doer of the word? Secondly, oops, what have I done? Purity, charity, purity, purity. Gotcha. We are to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. In other words, we are to have a passion. So we are to be serious people, a passion for personal purity. Because let's, we are to live out the word again. What's the gospel? What's the, what's the good news of Jesus? It's a message of cleansing. That we've been washed pure through the blood of Jesus spilt for us. And why has this happened? Because our God is a holy God. And he wants to call us into relationship with him as holy people. Therefore, we're to live out what we believe. We're to have a passion for purity, not being polluted by the world. We're set apart from God for God in this world. Where do they be the people who are the light of the world and a city together on a hill? A holy community. And in a world that is actively encouraging impurity in so many ways. They wonder why we don't just join with them in their flood of dissipation. We must remain unstained by the world. And yes, this is very prominent in our day in terms of sexual ethics. But it's not just, it's what does ambition mean? What does money mean? What do possessions mean? What's the good life? What does family mean? What does community mean? What does power mean? 
We are to reflect the values and the hope and the positivity and joy of the kingdom of God as doers of the word. Christianity is not a call to accept certain truths or follow religious patterns or to join a certain group or to sit least of all in a building with other people once a week. Christianity is essentially a life to be lived with all that embraces. It's a call to follow Jesus as Lord. It's a call to discipleship. It's verbal in its very nature. And it's a call to life, even life to the full. Life which we were made to be being restored to the fullness of the image of God. A life of blessing. It begins with repentance and faith and it goes on every single day with repentance and faith. As we put off the filthy and put on the pure word of truth. We do that because we want to be doers of the word. That is people who are quick to listen. Slow to speak. And slow to become angry. People who guard our tongue and exercise self-control. People who care for widows and orphans and keep ourselves unstained by the corruption of the world. Are people who do that together in unity as the light of the world, a city on a hill. It's the only way to live. It's God's way to live. And faith works. It is indeed the life of blessing. Or as Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Amen.